Hello and welcome to Ask Your Academic. Today's session will cover the MSc MedSci Cardiovascular Sciences and the MSc MedSci Clinical Pharmacology. We're joined by a number of our academic leads and they're here to answer any questions you might have about their programmes. Um, a number of questions have been submitted before today's session, so we'll do our best to cover off all of those. You can also use the chat box to ask any additional questions you might have. If after the session you have any further questions, um, you can email the programme administration teams for the programme and those details can be found on the programme web pages on our website uh, in the uh, blue box near the top. If you get any questions specific to uh, funding or your application, I'll pop some useful links into the chat box for those. Um, we are recording today's session, so that will be made available to you after uh, this morning. Uh, so we don't have much time, so if our panel could introduce themselves and give an overview of their programme. Ed, let's go first. Do you want to go I'll, ahead, Eleanor? Yeah, I'll go yeah. first. So hi, everyone. I'm Eleanor Davis. I'm one of the directors of our MSc Cardiovascular Sciences programme. And as the name of the programme suggests, it's a programme which provides an integrated understanding of the epidemiology of cardiovascular diseases, as well as looking at the molecular and cellular pathways that are involved in these diseases. The programme's been constructed to align with the strengths and the expertise that are within my school, which is the School of Cardiovascular and Metabolic Health. And it follows um, a particular structure. It's composed of a number of modules which take place in semester one and semester two. I can give you more details about those later if you want. And um, we also have a number of options that you can take. And after you complete these top components of the programme, you progress to doing a three um, month um, project, which can be based in a lab, can be data analysis, or it can be a dissertation. And hopefully at the end of that, you'll complete your master's degree. And I'll stop there. I can go into more details when we go forward. Sure, should I quickly just say hello because I'm aligned with Eleanor because I'm the co-director. So we've got a fire alarm on. So all this is a test well, just at this time. Yeah. So that was a test fire alarm. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Paddy Marks. I work with Eleanor. I am the co-director of the MSC Cardiovascular Sciences. I'll not reiterate all the details of um, what Eleanor said about the programme, but the idea is that we balance in terms of our interest and skills, Eleanor scientist and I am a clinic, clinical you know, clinician, but um, primarily the, the program is a scientific uh, pro master's um, uh, covering all the areas that Eleanor said, and we can talk about more detail of the subjects in detail. Maybe hand over to Jesse rather than take up all the time. Sure, thank you very much. So hello everybody, my name is Jess Dawson. I'm a um, clinical pharmacologist and a professor of stroke medicine at the University of Glasgow, and along with one of my colleagues, Dr. William Miller, who's a, a pharmacologist, we direct the Clinical Pharmacology MSc. And to summarize that, it is a fairly broad program that works through a variety of topics, including basic laboratory skills, some quite clinically focused um, elements around use of drugs in clinical practice, issues around pharmaceutical medicine and industry, and then the more kind of cutting edge topics like pharmacogenomic medicine um, and precision medicine. And the way the teaching is delivered is a mixture of group work, a small amount of laboratory-based work, lecture-based work, some online teaching materials, <clears throat> and also a project which takes place if you successfully conclude the taught um, element of um, the course. So in total, there are, um, I think it's a, 10 different courses, sorry, 10 different modules, um, and then the, the project. And as I say, they span the sort of breadth of clinical pharmacology from the more basic science elements all the way through to the um, clinical um, aspects. And what does the course lead to? Well, obviously, it leads to an MSc if you um, conclude it. Um, 
a fair number of our students go on to do PhDs. And we've recently had a number of students go on to work, quite a few in the pharmace pharmaceutical industry, sorry, and also quite a few moving into um, academic roles in, in various different um, universities, both within the UK um, and elsewhere. So we view it as quite a good entry into a career in clinical and applied pharmacology, both in industry and academia. Just a few questions about the project element of both programmes. So can you tell us a bit more about how students choose their topic, their supervisor, when they do all that? Ella, do you want to go? <laughs> Should I do that and tell her you did all the talking? Should I just just to, um, to give Eleanor a break? So, so, um, so in semester one and semester two, students have mainly taught also lab work and uh, um, you know practice and practical work. So, so it gives them an, an overview of some of the areas of interest uh, that are ongoing within our school, and based on things that students have been either found interesting or their own interests, they usually nominate a the topics they might be interested in that might be heart failure or hypertension or kidney disease or uh, maybe a, a methodology like epidemiology or a lab skill um so, so we asked the students to highlight a, a couple of areas of interest and that can be quite focused as the student knows or equally can be quite broad and then we we allocate them to the supervisors and again you know within glasgow supervisors if you like not nominate that they will have projects available throughout the summer. So we we gen it is a matching program, um, you know, matching student interests to uh, supervisors. Um, that usually happens. We we ask for the topics in about uh, January February. So students may not have completed everything, and then we we start the matching process in about March with a view that we get it all tidied up by now. So students should be. Um, should have an idea of who their supervisor is by the by the by generally the end of April. Um, projects usually start actually just around the start of June. So I've just met my um, student um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's roughly how it works. So it's basically a sort of matching matching scheme. Um, yeah, I hope that's so on this project itself is a, over the summer and then usually hand in towards the end of, of August, working along with the supervisor. We find it very rewarding, actually. Most of the students really do enjoy it um, and, you know, approach it like a proper scientific thing, but the end result could look like a scientific paper and sometimes does become a full scientific paper. I'll maybe stop there, let others chip in. Yeah, just we, we follow exactly the same process in principle, although the timelines are usually for clinical pharmacology one or two weeks slightly later, um, but, but it's exactly the same process and we typically again try to match students to what they want and there's also the opportunity we've had one or two students this year have organized to do projects with industry with a co-supervisor within the um within the university so there is the possibility to be quite flexible and if there were particular um needs or wishes that people had we'd encourage you to you know let us know that you know when you arrive in, in semester one and then we can think about how we can tailor things for you Maybe I can also just say that we we usually ask students if they want to do a laboratory based project, if they want to do some sort of data analysis project, or if they want to do a dissertation style project based on a viable research question. Thank you. And then someone had asked if you had any sort of examples of research topics that your current stu students are doing? So your um, current N NSC students for this cycle, uh, what sort of topics they're doing? So, for example, I have a student who's just starting with me, who requested a project, a lab based, a, a data analysis project on hypertension. And so we will be looking at endocrine hypertension, that's high blood pressure that's caused by imbalances in hormones. And we will be looking to see if we can use small molecules called microRNAs to try and be able to differentially diagnose these condi conditions 
and to look and see if the profiles of microRNAs and the circulation of these patients are different in various disease groups. So that's one example of a data analysis project. We've already measured all the microRNAs in a, a big patient cohort, and now the student will be analysing them. Um. I mean, I give you, we've, we're currently, well, maybe last year's example, we had a student who, one quite, quite often systematic reviews are popular because that's looking at a scientific approach to the current scientific literature and refining how well it answers some questions. And that, that's, a, that's a useful skill going forward. Um, we've also worked on data sets such as UK Biobank and the student has worked on you know, large data to um, either you know, better understand clinical conditions. And actually, this year, something slightly um, off topic because it's not cardiovascular science, but we're using a, a, a UK biobank to look at screening patterns for, for cancer, um, which is actually just you know look at a population health problem. And it just happened that um, this particular topic around cancer was was more of appeal mutually between student and the and the supervisor for particular project but the, the idea is that you know either looking systematic review which is quite popular because um it's a skill that is a lasting you know it's a skill which you can use if you're staying in academia but also using existing large data sets um it's, it's both very popular but also often leads to important scientific findings which the student can make as their own but with guidance with the analysis yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add to that because I think our projects are very similar in in terms of the, the the nature of them. I think what we've seen with the clinical pharmacology projects is that if we compare the type of projects to say a decade ago when it might have been much more in a lab doing HPLC, it's now much more around pharmacogenomics data, um, clinical trial data sets, etc. Because that's you know where the world is 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 moving, um, and pharmacology like ev every other aspect of of, of medicine and life sciences is changing. So we're definitely seeing more of those analysis, large data, systematic review type um, projects than, than we used to. Thank you. So I've touched on it a little bit, but how much lab experience will students get throughout their NAC? Shall I? start with the the clinical pharmacology um course so we have um two courses within the so two um modules within within the wider course that that are quite lab and and um data focused and and they would be drug disposition um and there's some um other laboratory courses that that students can do so you're looking at probably somewhere in the region of around 10% of the taught course modules would be laboratory time. There's a, another component that's kind of lab based, although it's not, you know, if you like using a pipette in a lab, but it would be using things like making uh, calculations using laboratory data. So drug calculations, et cetera, metabolism calculations, those sorts of things. And then although it's not laboratory based, of course, it, again, in terms of using a, a pipette, the pharmacogenomics and molecular medicine course um, is very much laboratory, you know, kind of based in, in spirit in that it, it's dealing with kind of cutting edge analysis techniques and, and those sorts of things. I think it is important though, ju just to highlight that, you know, as I say, the course is naturally different than it was a decade ago when students did loads of experiments running HPLC, you know, type experiments, which we do to a small extent but it's nowhere near as important as it used to be in, in clinical pharmacology. So there've been some slight changes to mirror that. So 10 to 15% of the taught element would be a reasonable estimate. So our program is, is quite similar. In semester one, we do have a clinical and research laboratory skills course, which will, you know, it's a 10 credit course that teaches the students basic skills in the laboratory. We do have other options, which, you know, assessment of vascular function, et cetera, which 
are, are data-based courses, but they will show students how data is generated and demonstrate how you know, um, you know vascular data is generated. I would say that you know to reassure students who maybe don't have much experience in a lab, if they come into the lab for the projects, they are not left in the lab themselves. There are a number of we have a large school. We have a, a large number of PhD students and postdoctoral um, um, research assistants in the lab, as well as the PIs of each group. And they would be, you know, shadowed in the lab and taught the various techniques that they need to know for their projects. And that would be, you know, following some quite extensive instruction in health and safety aspects of the lab as well. Thank you. Paddy, do you want to add something? No, I don't, I don't know anything right? else because Elder has more involved in the running of, or say running or directing of the lab based on the type of much else. Perfect. Um, and then we were asked so how much class time students will have so through semester one and semester two, um, if there's such thing as a typical week Um, for our programme, semester one, we do um, 60 credits in semester one. 60 credits really equates to 600 hours of, of, of teaching and self-directed learning. I would say that, you know, the weeks do vary from week to week depending on what course is, is, is being taught that week, whether it's a practical course, whether it's a taught course. So the classes will be together throughout the week, but it's not every day, every week on a Tuesday from nine to 12, it does vary. So some of those will be, we can, we can give you in the programme details if you need any further information. Yeah, again, that split is is very similar, um, roughly 60 credits in, in semester one and then semester two with clinical pharmacology. And there's a little bit of structure in that the courses, each module within the course does typically run at a, a similar time throughout it. So, for example, the two courses that I direct are two hours on a Thursday morning in semester one and semester two. And to give you an example from them, the there's two hours timetable, but usually we spend about an hour and a half in a, you know, sort of teaching format. And we would expect students to go away and do somewhere in the region of say six to seven hours of, of revision and task-based work, you know, following on from, from that week and um, probably a bit less than that around five hours, say of, 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 of reading time. Um, but we, we obviously structure that for you. You know, we we give you clear guidance as to what we expect you to do and what we want you to do. And typically we debrief that in, you know, one form or another um, in, in a follow-up session. Thank you. Um, and is there anything students can do to prepare for starting their MSc in September? So any recommended reading or anything they can be doing? I was giving... Um... So this is a slightly challenging topic because it is some of our students want to arrive enthusiastic, but I think we always remember that people come from such variety, you know, they do come from a variety of backgrounds and, for example, people in our courses often come from either they have medical degrees or veterinary degrees or nursing degrees or have a primary degree in a basic science, but just your biology, physiology, anatomy, etc. So people come from such wide variety of backgrounds that often saying oh you should study this is is actually not because it can be intimidating mm -hmm. we'd say if people are interested um, there's no harm in looking at the you know, the web page for our institute is a good place to start and just look at some scientific papers some people have published and that's as good a place as any um but it sort of depends a little bit on your background and what you want to get out of it and that it will be different i mean jesse's already highlighted the where people come out at the other end um, and the needs for the, the expected outcome for somebody who's a clinical 
doctor who wants this is to get some basic science understanding versus somebody who wants to use our courses as a uh, as a route to a PhD might be different. So, so I do think it's it, it is challenging that you should read this paper or this textbook. And I particularly, I mean, there is a textbook written by our institute, but asking people to buy textbooks is, is, is a bit unfair. Um, so I, I tend to say, usually, and certainly the first thing I do, I'm, I'm my lecture happens to be one of the first lectures in the course. In, at night, I tend to send out immediately before, or, you know, a day or two before, or just after the lecture, a, a, you know, four or five scientific papers for background reading, which are not mandatory, but it'll be a good way to illustrate for future exams. And for the yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, you're unlikely to be um, accepted onto the course if you don't have a life sciences background. And if you do have a life sciences background, certainly from the pharmacology perspective, you should be well prepared to, to to pick things up. I mean, obviously, if you've done a basic pharmacology degree, you'll find the first few weeks of the course easier than if you've done a slightly different life sciences degree. But we haven't seen any issues with, with people from very varied backgrounds coming through the course, um, provided they have that background. So I would, I would share... Um, um, I would echo those comments that, you know, if you want to do some reading, some general reading around cardiovascular disease or around pharmacology, whichever course you're interested in is, is all you need to do and because you'll have plenty of time and plenty of deadlines to focus on when you arrive. Perfect, thank you. Um, and it's been touched on a little bit, but uh, what do graduates of the programme go on to do? Um, as Jesse says, most a lot of them go on to do a PhD, um, which is great. Um, and when they're part of the programme and they meet all the staff within the school, they do get the opportunity to, to discuss, you know, going on to do a PhD with staff that they might be interested in, in pursuing studies with. You know, sometimes the students have to have to secure funding to do that. Sometimes they apply for some of the schemes that are available in Glasgow. For example, I direct our British Heart Foundation PhD training scheme. So one student on this year's cohort, for example, has now got a place on, on that scheme as we go forward. Um, some of our students um, also go into a range of different jobs. Some of them, we have, have a lot of international students in our course, so some of them go back home. And the degree here allows them to, you know, it, it works as a stepping stone to, you know, develop their careers um, back home, which is great. Um, a lot of our students have gone into the NHS you know, in the, in the laboratories and, you know, running some of the um, technical operations, cl you know, clinical biochemistry, for example, clinical genetics labs. So some of them have gone in, in there. Um, some of them have gone and done other master's programmes again. So we've got a wide range of things, really, that the students go going to do. Yeah, exactly the same. And, and just to reiterate what, what I said um, before, we, we see a large number of students do PhDs. We see a large number of our international students returning home to, to more senior positions, for example. And we have a smaller but not insignificant number that go direct into the pharmaceutical industry or direct into academic positions. For example, one of last year's graduates has just been appointed as a lecturer in health sciences at a university down south, um, which was a, you know, he was a, a lovely guy, a really good student. So that was a, a great success. So it's along those themes. Thank you. And um, we are just approaching the end of the session. So I don't know, is there anything that you feel hasn't been covered that you would like to mention? Or there has been a lot of information there. Makes me all quite happy. I, I guess so. The one thing we've not touched on is that we do have um, student reps, you know, appointed early in the early in the term, early in the semester, and we we try and meet them. Well, not we try. We do meet them 
at least once per semester. And often, you know, I mean, we're trying to do our best to cover what can be improved about the course. And I clearly the course is ongoing, but usually they can highlight if there's been a particular issue with them, um, you know, as a usually marking not being back on time or room time, or, you know, this is a big campus and making sure that the rooms are booked in advance and things like that. And sometimes there are little tweaks, but the idea is that we have interaction with the students. We do, we do listen to them and clearly student reps would be so that they are representative of the views of the course. We always know that people want to do these things differently. Not everyone wants to be very vocal. Some people do want to have lots of engagement, we, but we do have that opportunity to have more direct um, engagement with our students. So it's, it's not just we teach and don't listen. We, we do want to hear what students think of the course throughout the throughout it. Thank you. And well, that is half past now. So thanks very much to our panel for taking time out of your busy day. And thanks everybody that joined to watch. Like I said, if you've got any further questions, please do send those to the programme administration teams and they'll get back to you. Um, and the recording will be shared later on today with you. So thanks again, and hopefully we'll see you all in September. Thank you. Indeed. Bye -bye. Yeah, I look forward to Thank it. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.